Thank you, Karen, for your truly kind introduction. It's a pleasure to work alongside such a reputable organization, such as the Chicago Urban League. Your work to achieve equity for black families and communities through social and economic empowerment is of great necessity and of value to each one of us here today. Your hard work for people of color is appreciated and recognized around the world. Everyone, please give Karen Freeman Wilson a round of applause. And just as fitting, today's panelists represent a wealth of experience and expertise to start an informative and productive discussion on the intersection of sustainability and DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I am honored to moderate to I am honored to moderate today's summit luncheon and introduce today's panelists. Our first panelist is Alethea Jackson. <laughs> Alethea Jackson is Senior Vice President of Environmental Social and Governance and Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for Walgreens Boots Alliance. In her role, yes, give her a round of applause. For her. In her role, Alethea leads a combined team of U.S. diversity, equity, and inclusion and corporate social responsibility, including health equity, environmental and product sustainability, and community giving. Alethea is an experienced government relations executive with 20 years of success with Walgreens. America's Health Insurance Plans and National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Please welcome one more time, Alethea Jackson. Next we have Jessica Munich. Jessica is Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for United Airlines. In this role, Jessica is leading informational change through a holistic strategy to embed diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout the business and enhance relationships with employees, customers, communities, and commercial partners. In her previous role of Managing Director, Labor Relations, and Legal Strategy, she worked closely with senior management, providing counsel on labor litigation, negotiations, contract administration. Please welcome Ms. Jessica Munich. And our next panelist is Gil Kionis, who leads ComEd, an Exelon company, which powers the lives of more than 4 million residential and business customers, or 70% of Illinois of Illinois' population. He is responsible for the safe and reliable delivery of electricity to customers and for empowering them to manage their energy use. He oversees the management of the electrical grid for Chicago and most of Northern Illinois and comments partners with the diverse communities it serves. Before joining, joining ComEd, Kiona served more than a decade as president and CEO of the New York Power Authority, the nation's largest state-owned electric utility. Please welcome Gil Kionis. And I would like to thank all of you again for your expertise, engagement, and enlightenment and enlightenment that you will share with us today. There are several questions that we have for our panelists. Each panelist will ask to, be, will ask to provide information that we all can benefit from. It is my goal to get through all of the questions so that we can obtain as much knowledge as possible, 
But also, you all will have an opportunity. You all will have an opportunity to submit questions to our panelists. So everyone on your um, name tag, you have a QR code. And there's also, I believe, a QR code that's flashing on the um, monitor every now and then. Scan that QR code. It'll take you to an app where you can send a question. And I'll get it up here, and we'll be able to ask your question live. So we're going to go through about six questions that have already been submitted, and then I look forward to seeing your unique questions that you have for the panelists here today, OK? OK. All right, all right. You all ready to get this conversation going? Yeah. All right, so let's get this great, interesting conversation started. What I am going to do is come over here and sit with you guys. All right, so our first question Anyone can jump in and answer at any time. In your role, how do you define sustainability? And what are one or two examples of what it looks like in your workplace? Jump in. You can jump in right in. Uh, I wanted to say thank you first to Urban League for leading this conversation. I feel like you all are on the forefront. Um, really important conversation. I'm the, um, only DE, I think I know we're uh, DEI professionals and sustainability professionals on the stage. We need to see more of that in this conversation um, kind of continue to evolve. Uh, so I'll start with kind of just the United Airlines, um, you know, perspectives. This might sound a little bit like a commercial for United Airlines, but, you know, we are a business. Um, I'll, 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 we are growing um, faster than any airline has ever grown in the history of aviation. I'll start there. So. Um, it's not just growth for the sake of growth. We're thinking about, as we grow, how can we make sure that we grow fairly and equitably? Um, and so that's kind of, when I start to think about sustainability, I'm thinking about um, our people strategy um, in order to meet our goals around, around that growth. Um, so we think about uh, sustainability being around limited resources, right? Um, I think about, human beings, right, you call it human resources, labor, whatever you want to call it, is also a limited um, resource, um, like our air, our water, our trees, our land. And how are we taking care of that limited resource? How are we making sure that um, in order to, to kind of meet the jobs for the, the need for hiring into jobs in the future, not just at the airlines, but more broadly, um, that the, 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 the human beings are ready with the necessary skills to meet that hiring demand. That's what I think when I think about sustainability, I'm kind of thinking about it from that human resources uh, perspective. And I can tell you about a lot of really amazing programs that we have around um, building up talent pipelines that are currently you know, drying up. Or, you know, the, the metaphors are really just endless when you think about um, kind of sustainability of talent, sustainability of natural resources. There's a lot that we have a responsibility to do today to prepare um, for future generations to thrive. Um, and so got, you know, we'll, we'll get into some specifics of like what that looks like at United Airlines, but a couple of things that come to mind is there's a pilot shortage right now. That's a drying up pipeline. And so what can we do to build more talent that's ready to, to take those seats in our flight decks? And as we do that, um, how can we make sure that they reflect the diversity of the communities that we serve? So what we did was build a pilot school in Goodyear, Arizona, where we are training about 5,000 pilots over the next 10 years, and we created a diversity goal uh, connected to that to that school, uh, where each class is 50 will be at least 50 percent women and people of color, and um, because currently we are about um, 80 percent uh, white men. Um, in our flight decks, um, you know, and so that's not sustainable, right? You can't keep going to the same sources of talent and expect that it's going to be there forever. So how can we raise awareness and access to those jobs for us in, in creating our own school, tying a diversity goal to it, and we've exceeded that goal um, with our first class being 80% women and people of color. When you, when you step into an aircraft and you look to the left and you look at the flight deck, what you see somebody that looks like you, and we want young people to see that and know that this is a career for them as well. So that's one of the things that we're doing around the sustainability of, of talent at United Airlines. Um, sure, and then I'll hop in um, from a Walgreens perspective, and I really love the fact that we're having 
this conversation and we're anchoring the discussion around sustainability with workforce um, because it's so important. Um, sometimes it's missed, but when we think about environments, right, um, the workforce is an environment to the point of what's at risk and making sure that we are putting those sort of controls and measures in place the same way we protect sort of our natural environment, uh, air, water, that we're doing the same with our workforce as well. And so as a, an integrated healthcare retail company that has over 240,000 employees across the country and over 320,000 globally really looking at our workforce and our team members and our, our in every community across the country and our competitive communities. And so for us, it is really looking at that workforce um, and ensuring that we are creating one development opportunities um, and opportunities for growth as well as retention. Um, but similar to your, when you think of uh, pilot, there is a pharmacy shortage, a uh, pharmacist shortage, right? And so a shortage in the pharmacist pipeline. And as we look at pharmacists and the critical role that they play in communities, especially as we're just coming out of a pandemic and recognizing the role they played with getting vaccine shots and arms to people across the communities, especially hard to reach communities, we know that's incredibly important. And so putting some measures in place for us, our perspective is working with uh, schools of pharmacy to try to support diversity in that pipeline and then drilling down even more and looking at some of those historically black colleges and universities that have schools of pharmacy to help to create programming around that for us. Um, and we also look at the diversity in our workforce and how important it is. And again, we saw that during the pandemic in order to reach communities that were either lack trust um, around the vaccine, it helped that we do have a very diverse workforce and so that people could go to the pharmacy or whether we showed up in community and saw people who looked like them uh, and that became, became a trusted source of information. So for us, it's again, continuing to have programs in place to protect that, uh, that workforce. Thank you, Gil. Yeah, well, thank you first for uh, inviting me to this very, very important panel. I like the fact that you say it's an intersection between sustainability and DEI because that's precisely how ComEd is looking at, uh, at this issue. Uh, our overall corporation, our parent company, Exelon, and all of the companies under Exelon, ComEd being one, uh, we have made a commitment, uh, we're calling it our path to clean, to cut our greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030 and be net zero by 2050. And we know we can probably get, there are available technologies that will get us to 80%, but there are going to be additional technology innovation that needs to happen to bridge that last 20%. Um, and not only our operations, but also our customers and the the stakeholders that we work with. But what's important is we look at that from a DEI perspective because we need to address issues from STEM to workforce development, which was brought up here today, to supplier diversity, uh, and to make sure that we are prioritizing disadvantaged communities, because they are the most susceptible to the impacts of climate change. And that's what we're doing at Comet as we plan our investments to modernize the grid, to work with our customers, to make sure that we're addressing uh, you know, low to moderate income customers who are having a hard time paying their bills. Uh, those are things that we need to address across the board. And, and that's part of what I would say, that that's part of comments DNA and central to our uh, strategy. Uh, one manifestation of that, we are in fact working very closely with the Chicago Urban League with uh, the Bronzeville Microgrid Project, uh, which is a project where we are, think of it as a test bed for what a clean energy community would look like in the future. Addressing resiliency, addressing reliability, addressing STEM, addressing workforce development, really a, a living lab on what 
can happen and what's the art of the possible in this energy transition. Thank you. Now, the next question, you all somewhat hit on this already, but so you might just have something additional to add. But the next question is, what are some ways that you feel sustainability and DEI intersect or overlap in your organization? So do you have situations or an example where they actually intersect and overlap? Sure, um, I'll just, I'll highlight um, maybe two. One, uh, as we look at our ESG pillars and uh, sustainable marketplace, and diversity, supply of diversity. And so really looking to ensure that we are working with diverse suppliers um, and we have those within supply chain. So what we've set forward within the company is leadership accountability goals. And one of those goals are supplier diversity. And so we continue to look at our target, continue to assess where we are and how we can continue to grow that pipeline and um, with diverse suppliers. And so that's uh, one of the ways in which we see that uh, intersecting for us. In our case, to, to really achieve our climate change goals statewide based on uh, goals set by the Climate Equitable Jobs Act, we will need the pipeline of skilled workers and, and other type of workers to implement that plan. So STEM and workforce development are critical, critical to achieving our goals. And in our case, to be able to do that, our workforce, to be able to be, to be, able to be successful, our workforce need to reflect the communities that we serve. Comet, we are probably, I like to say, the most place-based type company because we are literally connected every home is at home and businesses in our service territory. So we need to develop the, the pipeline of workers to be able to help us make this energy transition happen uh, and to be able, because the grid eventually, the grid is the facilitator for decarbonizing every sector of the economy. Without a modernized grid, we can't really decarbonize other sectors of the economy, whether it's transportation or buildings or industry. They can't be transformed without modernizing the grid. So it's critical for us to not just use diverse suppliers, but also to make sure we have the pipeline of clean energy workers. Yeah, and I, I would just kind of build on your, your comments about place space, and um, we've got some really ambitious uh, sustainability goals at United, um, zero um, emissions by 2050, and we are working to um, transition to sustainable aviation fuel. We are um, leading the industry really in our approach, um, not relying on carbon offsets or you know purchasing uh, credits or that kind of thing, but actually um, you know doing away with fossil fuels and moving towards sustainable aviation. So as we do that, what's the impact that we are having on? Um, communities where the necessary, you know, kind of work happens. Um, and so partners that we're working with are focused on um, creating jobs in the communities where we are, you know, converting trash into jet fuel, um, which is hugely, you know, innovative and it's an amazing kind of prospect for the future that we can move away from fossil fuels and let, and at the same time, let's not forget the human impact that we are having. Um, so they're, they're, you know, how do we do business with local um, black owned businesses in here in Indiana, my hometown, and <laughs> here. Um, how do we make sure we are investing in a local community by doing business um, with local uh, providers and creating jobs in, in those communities? So it's, it's early days and my kind of counterpart who's responsible for sustainability and I are beginning to kind of think about environmental justice in the future and how do we set some goals that are overlapping between our two areas. And, and simply, you know, simply building that accountability and tie to executive compensation, which we do right now with our um, supplier diversity goals, our talent goals, and our sustainability goals. But there's, I think, growing opportunity for intersection of uh, that goal setting. Thank you all. Those were great responses. And my takeaway from all of your responses is that actually sustainability and DEI 
intersect more than we ever think about it. You just have to be very um, intentional with your decision making and definitely spread awareness about more opportunities to all communities about, you know, in our organization. So thank you for those responses. The next question, people of color and particularly African Americans tend to be significantly underrepresented in the corporate world, especially in executive and other high paying positions. How do your companies diversity, equity, and inclusion, or environmental, social, and governance goals aim to address this? Well, let, let me begin. At, at ComEd, we're proud that our workforce is about 50-50, 50% diverse in women. Our, my executive team is the same. In fact, uh, it's, you probably don't know, but the two most critical functions at ComEd our chief customer officer and our chief technical officer are both women and uh, African American. They, they do the most critical work to make the grid that when you flip the switch in the morning, the lights turn on. And so our board is 100% diverse, 40% uh, women. It's important for a company like ComEd to reflect the communities that we serve. That's the way for us to optimize the services and really provide services that our customers value. So that's one example on, on how we achieve uh, equity and inclusion in the workforce. And it is something that it is that, that is planned. It is something that we measure. And it is something that, that is important to us because we know we know that diverse teams and diverse employees produce powerful outcomes. And, and we are a living example of that. I'll just piggyback there. <laughs> so, just looking at, again, uh, inclusive diversity. And um, so, if we look at, uh, we are lucky enough to uh, we have a black female CEO, like Ross Brewer, but we also have a really diverse <laughs> uh, executive committee. So, our leadership committee um, is almost 50% representation of people of color. And then we have a diverse board, but we've also set goals in place similar to what we have been discussed here. And so, with our, again, leadership accountability goals, we have targets around increasing representation of people of color and women. And we're very intentional about that work, again, to have that representation. But also, one of the things we've done are creating programs to help pipeline talent as well, because when we think about sustainability, so we, if we've done the hiring now, we want to make sure that we are also developing that talent. Last year, we launched a pilot program, Diverse Advocates, because we recognize what, was, what is a gap. Often people of color don't have advocates across companies, which are helpful in helping them to learn the company as well as advance. And so we launched a uh, Diverse Advocates program as a pilot, and now it's a full program this, uh, this year. What's great about it as well is that it is um, you self-apply, and so it's also not limited to you being seen just by someone and your name being put in the hat, but instead you can yourself apply to be a part of the program. So really removing barriers and creating those developmental opportunities for us. And so as we look at, again, increasing people of color and leadership, and we're also really proud to as we look at our leaders, our chief uh, customer officer is also an like African American female. Our global general counsel is an African American female. Our treasurer is an African American female. And then we have a host of other diversity there. Um, but it's just being really intentional to have those diverse voices around the table. Yeah, there's a lot of, I think, kind of similar similarity in our approaches. Um, and I'll name a few names, not to. Um, I, I never want to tokenize a person, but I feel like representation at the top is really important. And that's why I think you hear us naming these names. Our president is black uh, at United Airlines, Brad Hart. Uh, um, um, yeah, so he's, um, he was formerly our general counsel, and I've watched him transform um, the look of our uh, legal department, bringing in a lot of diversity um, and, and really you know, amazing qualified lawyers who have grown their careers uh, over the past 12 years that I've been with United, and I'm one of them. Um, 
And so, so also we have two amazing black women. I think Target is here today. Alicia Ward is a board member. Um, Michelle Hooper. That representation at the top is uh, really important because I, you know, success in DEI and in sustainability takes grassroots approach and it takes grass tops. You have to have really buy-in at the top to shape the culture and the expectations. Uh, and then, you know, so and, and then buy-in really across the board, which I feel we have that, you know. But to your question, I want to shout out one of the programs I'm most proud of um, in my last three years in this role. Um, in, in 2021, we created a similar program. Um, it's a sponsorship program called Ally where um, post-George Floyd's murder, we felt there was, there was a real need to focus on black talent. Um, and so we paired each of our black managing directors, which is my level of leadership in the organization, with our executive team for a mutual mentorship and sponsorship program. We call it mutual mentorship because there's learning that's possible on both sides. And our, our um, you know, still major, our majority white, you know, executive leadership team, there was an opportunity for learning across cultural difference there. Um, and fast forward just, you know, kind of to 2022, um, amazing kind of relationships that were built out of those pairings, um, learnings, I, I believe we uh, mission accomplished, there was learnings happening on both sides, we created a new black BRG, which has been hugely impactful to our culture, to our in recruiting, retention, um, advancement of black talent, um, and then we had two new officers join our officer ranks, getting us closer to, um, you know, general kind of U.S. population uh, representation of black talent at our officer level. And so really that, the, the program did bear some fruit. Um, it, it, you know, that sponsorship is, is um, an opportunity for talent to shine it's, and have leaders at that level see kind of what you're capable of. And, um, and that's exactly what happened is um, some, some promotions that came out of that program. And proud of. Thank you. Our next question, but before I ask the next question, I want to remind everyone to submit your questions online. We have two more planned questions before I'll be looking for your questions that you all have submitted through the QR code. So the next question, how do your organizations, DEI and sustainability efforts impact local communities? particularly those with fewer resources that might be disproportionately affected by environmental pollution, underemployment, or other factors that influence quality of life? Well, in our case, I mentioned before that when we look at the kind of investments we're going to make, not just on the grid, but on programs, for example, our energy efficiency programs, our energy efficiency programs for the past decade, let's just say, have saved our customers over $7 billion in their electric bills. The investment that we're making on the grid have avoided multiple outages that also save about over $3 billion from our customers. So we, we want to make investments that benefit everybody, but particularly, we are targeting our investments to make sure that we focus, that the benefits of our investments are realized in under-resourced communities. And we do that in, in, in several ways. We do it in how we invest in the grid, in terms of making the, the grid more reliable and resilient, but we also, but we also do it in programs such as energy efficiency, low cost, low cost solar, uh, building charging stations, making sure that it, they are not only located, working with developers to build charging stations for electric vehicles. When when that starts, uh, uh, the adoption rate starting to go up. We want to make sure that we don't have uh, a set of energy haves and energy have nots. And then that is, by the way, the goal of the CEJA legislation, the Climate Equitable Jobs Act. One of the tenets and the goals of that law is to make sure that the benefits, at least 40% of the benefits of investments of utilities, not just common, uh, are realized or experienced by under-resourced communities. I'll take a minute and go, you know, go to talent again. It's my uh, area of expertise, and I want to just kind of um, 
mention 110, uh, which is a talent partner uh, of ours. If you're not familiar with uh, 110, how many people know what 110 is? Oh, great. <laughs> I have an opportunity to share. Um, it's an amazing mission, which is to create 1 million jobs for black talent over the next 10 years um, that, are, that have a family sustaining wage and that do not require a four year degree. And so United has partnered with them. I think they're probably up to about 80 companies that are partnering at this stage. And I like in their um, approach to really being like a personal trainer. These are things that we were gonna be doing anyway, but they're like, they are like counting, counting our reps, you know, um, and holding us accountable. And, and you know, for us, that means our hires. How many people are you hiring into these roles? And I think we're up to about 3,000 since we signed on about a year and a half ago. Um, and so it's things like moving degree requirements from jobs where a four-year degree is not necessary to perform the, the job. Talk about sustainability. Only, um, I want to say, 66% of working age uh, adults in, in the U.S. have a college degree. Um, for uh, black talent, I think it's about 71% that do not. Uh, higher for Hispanic, I think it's closer to 80%. And um, that's, that is, we're building job descriptions for talent that, you know, is not out there. And so let's remove those barriers um, in order to broaden the funnel and bring more talent into the pipeline. So um, proud of that partnership with 110 and some of the programs that are in line with that mission for us are that pilot program that I mentioned earlier, our Flexible and Goodyear Arizona for, um, for pilots. We also have a technician shortage. You can make $75,000 <laughs> earning, uh, and if you are a technician at United Airlines, you know, in the door. And so we're building an apprenticeship program to, to create more access and awareness around these jobs, fixing our aircraft, fixing our ground equipment um, through an apprenticeship program. Where day one, you're earning uh, that wage of learning alongside our um, existing technicians. And finally, a program called um, Innovate for Digital Technology Careers. We do not see us in, you know, Black folks, Hispanic women are, are, are not as readily available for hire in the marketplace for um, amazing careers at United in our digital. So we're, we're a technology company when you think about it. To run the aircraft and the air, uh, in the operation, we, we need a lot of amazing technologists. So those careers are ones that we're also um, creating apprenticeships for. And similarly to our pilot program, each of these will have that diversity goal of 50% women and people of color in each cohort. Um, and so we, you may have heard of um, IC Stars, which is a, an upskilling organization. We are uh, we're partnering with talent partners in the local communities that are under resourced to say, hey, this is a career that you can consider um, to, to come and work at an airline. I mean, I, I mean, when I was living in the area, I never thought I'd be working at an airline. <laughs> uh, but to raise awareness and access to these roles is part of our mission in these underserved communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Craig. I'll hop in. I'm going to talk a little bit about health of being a healthcare company. And so what we like to look at, first of all, in our local footprint across communities, almost 50% of our stores are located in underserved communities. And so really looking at health, health equity, and also the intersectionality between environment and health based on where people live. We want to help ensure that your zip code doesn't determine your lifespan. And so really utilizing our diverse workforce um, and looking at how do we drive better access to healthcare locally? How can we help improve outcomes? And how can we reach into where we see vulnerabilities? One of the programs that we do is Vitamin Angels. It's a partnership, and that looks at maternal health. And so where we have women who are in vulnerable communities and who lack access to prenatal vitamins and minerals, helping to them to access that. We actually launched a, it's a part of a global program, um, which the goal is to reach 500 million women and children by 2025. And we launched a pilot program in Chicago in the south and west side, reaching women who don't have insurance, who don't have access to uh, the vitamins. And we've reached a thousand uh, women so far. And so that's one of the areas, but overall continuing to build out programs around healthcare where we see vulnerabilities and are able to help fill a gap and avoid. Um, and then also wrapping around that with the social determinants of health as we look at economic impacts and other areas that have an effect on people's health. Um, and so whether that's looking at our supplier diversity program, which addresses the economic um, impact um, and economic stability, or another great program that you may be 
familiar with is Hope Chicago, and so that's an intergenerational scholarship program um, for students who are in vulnerable communities, and so really helping to bridge that educational gap that then brings them forward into our workforce, um, and again, helps to create some stability and hopefully helps to address some of the social determinants of health. Thank you all for those responses. So we're going to start, we have one more plans question, but what I'm going to do is incorporate um, it with one of the questions online. And you all are great with these um, questions online. So we'll try to get to it. Um, let's start off by maybe just one person answer. If you're itching to say something about the topic, you know, jump right in. But I would love to try to get through most of the live questions that were presented. So first question of this new way. The DEI and the e and ESG are both um, kind of popular words right now. They're the hot topics. But how do you plan to um, gauge if you're moving the needle? Like, what would you like to see accomplished in the next three to five years? talk myself out of the job, but the buzz, you know, it starts to become buzzwordy, and I um, just want to kind of acknowledge that. Like, um, I hope that we are doing this work, and it's, you know, it's not called DEI hiring, it's just hiring, right? And it's kind of how we are seeing it, it's like embedding it into um, everything that we do, because it's just who we are, and it's just good for business. We're removing barriers that are not good for business, that are not good for people, that are, so it's it's like a, it's a win-win, it's kind of what we're after, and I'd like to see, to answer your question, in a few years. This change, this change takes time, um, so I'm not able to see unhealthy, unsustainable growth in our in uh, executive ranks in the U.S., but I would love to see um, CEOs and boards, uh, you know, those positions reflect the diversity of our nation, you know, be closer to, um, you know, 13, 14 percent than we are right now um, in, in those kind of leadership roles, and that, I think that we won't cheat, see that change likely in our lifetimes, but to be able to see them maybe double over the next three to five years, I think would give me some confidence that this is like a bellwether that it will happen in the next generation. Yes, thank you. And I was talking to a staff person and I said, well, before we just called it being fair, like being fair, giving out opportunities to everyone. Okay, the next question, are you partnering with institutions of higher education with, for internships? Absolutely, absolutely, and uh, we probably are partnered with most of the, the colleges and, and universities here in Chicagoland. Uh, like I said, this energy transition is going to need a lot of uh, new workers to, to make this happen. In fact, we did a study with a third party expert on how the jobs and the mix of jobs in the energy sector will evolve if we implement the, the law of CJA, the Climate Equitable Jobs Act. And it, it uh, said, the study basically said that we will need up to 40,000 net new jobs between now and 2030 to meet the decarbonization goals uh, that, that are included and in, uh, codified in, in that law. So, uh, from, from our perspective, partnering with local schools, uh, we also have a program for our trades, line workers. Uh, we've been working very closely with CPS uh, and other institutions because to be a line worker, you can, you can have a, a high school education and, and be trained by uh, ComEd as part of our apprenticeship program. And we have training programs that prepare you for that training. Uh, because these are very good jobs. A, a line worker at ComEd, when you be, first of all, we, if you get in the program, you, you, we pay you a part of the, a, while we're training you. And once you finish your, your, the first set of training, it takes about three years to, to get to a, uh, a journeyman lineman, uh, you can earn up to $80,000. And over time, maybe five, six years, you, you will be earning over $100,000. These are jobs that propel uh, individuals in our, in our youth into the middle class. It's not for everyone, but as I've said, all the jobs in the energy sector, not just 
in, in the utilities, but we are going to need people who know how to install and maintain solar. We, we, we're going to need people how to put energy efficient equipment in buildings, how to build and maintain charging stations, etc. And so this energy transition, especially with all the, the programs from the state and the federal government, from the Inflation Reduction Act, from the Infrastructure Investment Jab, all of those programs that will propel this energy transition will also help spur, hopefully, the new workforce that are going to be required to uh, effectuate this, uh, this energy transformation. Awesome, and um, would they just visit your website for internship opportunities? Come again. Would they just visit your website, website for internship opportunities? Absolutely, we, we, we do and we, we, we also, we're very active in social media and so we advertise in all of our channels and social media when there are opportunities for either a STEM, for future utility scientists, engineers and professionals but also just as important for our craft and trade uh, employees. Great. Um, Jessica, do you, does your company have internship opportunities and how do you ensure your company's ability to work with small businesses? Or is there opportunity for small businesses? Yeah, 100%. So similarly, you can check out our website, uh, united.com slash careers. Um, and look for information about the programs that I mentioned. They're called um, Aviate, Calibrate, and Innovate. We're, we're calling them our Pathways program, and that, that website's going to launch um, later this month. Uh, but the program information is there, and you can join the talent community for when, um, for instance, that Calibrate program when the technicians come to uh, Chicago. But to your question about internships, yes, uh, we are really building out our HBCU strategy and um, PBI. We we're partnered closely with um, Chicago. State University, um, and so that is a big focus for us, and internship opportunities are also available on our career site. Uh, second question that you had was about doing um, business with small businesses. Huge focus for us. We want to create millionaires and billionaires and introduce folks into doing business with not just United Airlines, but you start doing business with us, you can do business with other um, airlines and airports, etc. And so uh, we have a Huge goal to reach the billion dollar round table by 2025. That's spending a billion dollars with diverse owned businesses. And over the past couple of years, um, we have, well, last year we doubled um, compared to uh, 21. And in 23, we expect to double our spend with diverse owned businesses um, as compared to 22. Um, and part of that is about removing barriers uh, to doing business with us in terms of like, you know, how quickly you get paid <laughs> and is that going to have an impact on the viability of your business? We we recognize that there are opportunities for improving access uh, to doing business with us, and so we're actively working on that. And one, and one of the um, new vice presidents that I mentioned earlier is actually our new vice president of sustainability, um, who is a phenomenal uh, leader. And um, so, yes, there's information on our website as well about how you can apply to be uh, uh, to, to do business with us. And I would encourage you, if you are a woman-owned, minority-owned, um, person with disability owning business, please. Uh, be certified so that you can help us uh, reach our billion dollar ambition and help yourself get access to amazing um, uh, uh, opportunities to do business with companies who, who, who have that as a value, which all of our suppliers do. Thank you. And Aliki, I want to ask you the same question because I do feel it's important. Really quick, internship opportunities and opportunities for small businesses to work with your company. Sure, absolutely. So we do have an internship program. Um, I'm actually proud to say that we will, under our sustainability portfolio, be bringing on uh, one of our interns is going to be joining us full time. So we have a very robust internship program. Um, and so and you can find that online as well. And we're really intentional about um, ensuring that we, again, um, have interns, that they also have an opportunity to interface with um, our leadership and just to hear more about career pathing across the company. And then with respect to diverse suppliers, yes, so we, again, um, we have a supplier diversity goal. Similarly, we are on the pathway to the billion dollar round table. And we also hold a number of summits. Um, so diverse supplier summits, uh, we're holding a strategic supplier exchange to actually talk through and help uh, them understand and sort of overcome some of the barriers um, of entry and really understand how to scale, not just get on the shelf, but to scale um, with us as well. 
And, and if I could just add, same thing, I, I didn't answer the small businesses. Um, that is a big part of what we do at Comment. In fact, last year, 43% of all of our spend at Comment was to certify diverse businesses. That's just a little bit under a billion dollars of our spend last year went to certify diverse businesses. 600 plus million of that in local businesses in our service territory. So it's, it's a big part of, of what we do and who we are. Thank you. Okay, we have three questions that we're gonna try to get through. Let's keep the, um, let's try to keep our, right, right, well, as rapid as it can be. But there are questions with the most likes that have been um, entered online. So first for comment, comment, as the future is empowering individuals or small businesses towards being an alternative energy producer, solar. Wait, comment as the, I lost the question, sorry you guys. Comment, as the future is empowering individuals or small businesses towards being an alternative energy producer, solar, is comment, do you consider yourself a roadblock or an alley? The next question is, as comment moves towards achieving its renewable energy goals, how will Comet ensure that energy will be affordable to low-income families in the future? Well, the first question, we, our goal is to integrate as many and as much solar energy to us as solar and other renewables into our system. The goal of CJA, the law that I've been talking about, is to have 40% of our system supplied by renewable energy by 2030 and 50% by 2040. So we are endeavoring ourselves to meet and exceed those goals. In terms of affordability, one of the, uh, there are, we have a set of customers who are having, uh, you know, difficulty in, in paying their bills. But one thing that you should know is that ComEd's average residential bill is one of the lowest in the country. I'm not saying that we, th th there are segments of, of customers that we shouldn't help. But the way for us to keep our bills low is to run a very efficient company. That's number one, we have to be efficient. Uh, and number two, when we make investments, we need to make sure that we are doing the right things and the right priority so that they are not causing uh, bill impacts that are unsustainable for our customers. So we work on that very, very hard. We understand that we are an important part of that equation. Thank you. And our time is up, you guys. I know we had like two more hot questions on this um, iPad, but the panelists, will you stick around after this for maybe just five minutes? If you want to ask them personally, you might be able to. But I would like to thank the Chicago Urban League for hosting this summit. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Talithia, and thank you, Gil. Thank you. Would you all like to say a quick closing statement? Quick, Gil. Quick closing statement. It's, you know, just, just grateful, grateful that you included me and included us here. Uh, Comment. We are a, we've been great partners with the Chicago Urban League, and we look forward to working uh, closely with you and all of you going forward. Thank you, everyone. Give a round of applause. Jessica, would you like to close? Sure. Yeah, just a, just a reminder to go to our website if you're interested in any of the career path programs that I spoke about or doing business with United Airlines. Um, and, uh, and thank you again to Urban League for convening the conversation. It really is um, in, in important, and I appreciate all the leaders in the room who are doing their part um, to set up the future generations. Um, to, you know, not just to be able to survive, but to thrive um, on, this, on this planet of ours, um, economically, socially, and in every way you can imagine. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Alethea Jackson, would you like to close? Sure, I'd also like to thank the Urban League for convening this conversation and for making it such a um, sort of a diverse stream of conversations when we think about sustainability and the, and the environment, um, but pulling through to the workforce, pulling through to DEI, and diverse businesses, because we all play a role as we think about the environment and sustainability. So thank you for having us.
Thank you all once again. Everyone give them a round of applause. Thank you, Chicago Urban League. I appreciate y'all for the opportunity to host the Water Rate this forum. I'm Carrie Steele, President of the Board of Commissioners at Water Reclamation. Really quick, I would like to acknowledge one of my board mates, Mariana Spiropoulos, that was in the audience. And my Vice President, Kimberly Needy Duguclay, will be speaking later, but thank you all and have a great afternoon.